I'm just so excited, amen, about God getting us up one more day, amen, amen, amen. We have troubles, isn't that right? But we still ought to be glad that God has blessed us, amen, with another day, amen. Praise the Lord. Somebody say, I'm going to run on, amen, and see what the end is going to be. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to call this hour our attention to the gospel of Matthew chapter 26. And I want to say that I'm so excited to be alive. Amen. Another day. Uh, Sister Brittany, it's not my birthday, but I'm happy anyway. Amen. Amen. That's all I'm saying. Be happy that you know it. Your face will surely show it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 26. want to remind everyone, even those that are joining us online, we're delighted that you're with us, that today we will be celebrating communion. Amen. So we want you to hang in there with us. We know that in many ways on social media that people are jumping in and out, but I want to challenge you to stay with us as we're in worship. I'm quite certain that whatever you might want to get to, hopefully it'll be there later, but stay with us as we worship and, and share in communion together. Reverend Lewis Simmons, it's good to see you, sir. Praise the Lord. It's a lot to see you here. Amen. And all of our guests, amen, in person and online. I want to just share a few things with you, and then we'll prepare to go into a word of prayer. On November 21st, we do have Family and Friends Day at 1045 a.m. in the parking lot. We still need to practice social distancing. I have had all of my shops, including the booster. In the last two or three weeks, I probably have had at least six or seven tests on COVID. Thank God all of them were negative. When we were traveling from the U.S. to Ghana and Liberia, you had to test getting in, test getting out, and test before you get on the plane. I'm saying all that to say that even though I've been tested thoroughly, plan on getting another test sometime soon, I've had my shots and my booster. I'm not foolish enough to say that the potential of possibility is not there to catch COVID. And I'm saying that to all the folk that think because you've been vaccinated, had your booster, and you wear your mask sometime, and somehow you're foot loose and fancy free. No, you are not. So I want to challenge and encourage as we come together. We're still in the pandemic, but I think the more we practice the social distancing and wearing our mask, then the more we can come together in different settings. Amen? So I want to encourage you to do likewise. So, but I'm saying that to say on the Feb November the 21st, the Family and Friends Celebration with Stuart Chapel, we'll be in the parking lot, and we'll say more about the specifics. But early that morning at 9.30 a.m., we have Attorney Robinson with us to teach and remind us about anti-bullying, and she's also included uh, cyberbullying. I want to remind folks the more we on social media, a lot of times people are being bullied that way. And I was just in some training this past week. Many of our young people are becoming depressed, and many of them have committed suicide based on being bullied online. So, my brothers and sisters, we want to challenge and encourage you to join us for a full day, and we'll get more particulars moving forward. At this time, may we join in a word of prayer. Thank you, Minister Gandhi, and preaching a couple of weeks ago. Let's give Minister Tierra Gandhi. Amen. Hand clap. And also thank you, Dr. Jackson, for a very powerful word on last week. Praise the Lord. And we thank God for all of our preachers just trying to work, work them in before the year is out. And we are grateful for that. Amen. May we pray. Eternal Father, we thank you that we can assemble one more time in this place as your people. We know, Lord, that the physical church is not the only church, for we are the church wherever we are. But we do thank you, Lord, that we have a place where we can gather together and to worship you in spirit and to worship you in praise. We thank you for each person that is present under the sound of my voice in person and online. Heavenly Father, we need your strength right now to keep on pressing. Everybody is dealing with different things, but you're the same God. Your word reminds us that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord God, we lean and we depend on you. 
We pray now that you give a word that will speak to us right where we are so that we can be further in Christ and less of this old word. Use me now, Lord. Use us all. In the name of Christ, we do pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you look with me in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 26 to 28, we find the following words for our hearing. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. This hour we want to talk about, do you need an oil change? Do you need an oil change? At the moment, people are entertaining, I know I am whether to get a hybrid car or an electric car. You know, electric vehicles now are the way of the future. And unlike an electric car that uses an electric motor, the average car uses a gas-operated or combustion engine needing at least five quarts of oil. Is that right? Oil is necessary to lubricate the engine and also to keep it from becoming too hot. One day a man named Jim never changed the oil in his truck and he found out the hard way. He would always run his engine until the oil became too low. Sound familiar? One day as he was driving down the street, his truck began to slow down and do this jerking reaction. Then all of a sudden he heard a grinding noise and smoke came from the hood and the truck came to a halt. The engine had overheated and began to melt on the inside. The pistons had frozen and the engine locked up. All because Jim refused to change his oil. The human body just like a car, is in need of five quarts of oil. If you didn't know it, the body takes on average five quarts of blood. There's always an exception. Some people need a little more and some a little less. However, just like in a vehicle, the oil needs to be changed. There's also maintenance for the human body, which is necessary. Just like changing oil and rotating tires on a car. Things such as exercise and rest and healthy eating and managing stress is a good recipe for keeping the blood flowing and circulating throughout the body. But just like Jim who refused to do maintenance on his truck, too many people refuse to do maintenance on themselves. Too many believers refuse to do maintenance, allowing their bodies to break down and to slow down and to come to a halt. And like an oil change, we need our blood. Yes, we do. We need our blood to be yeah. refreshed. We yeah. need fresh oxygen to every part of the human anatomy. We need our blood that brings nutrition to every aspect of the body. We need our red blood cells to form platelets and white blood cells to help us in our immunity. But when the blood has become compromised, there's, a, there's another blood that involves maintenance for the human spirit. There's another blood that helps salvation for the soul. There's another blood that can help when our bodies become broken down. And like an engine that needs automotive oil, the body needs 
hemoglobin and the spirit needs the blood of Jesus for everyday maintenance. Yeah. The body needs yeah. the, the spirit of Jesus for some cleansing. The, the body needs, you needs the spirit of God for some newness. You need the spirit of God and the yeah. blood of Jesus for the remission of our sins. Yeah. Do, do you need an oil change? Do these scriptures help us this hour. In verse 26, that as they were eating, thank you, Jesus, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. As we envision, and some of you had that, that picture around your dinner table, the 12 disciples sitting with Jesus and, and food was on their mind as they were eating the Passover. Little were they thinking about that the next day Jesus would be falsely arrested and accused and taken on trial and be executed on the same day. And while Jesus did eat, his mind was on having a serious conversation about the nature of the disciples that sat with him to eat this last meal before Calvary. And he said that one of you will betray me. Yet he still took bread and blessed it and gave it. And what the passage reveals to us, that Jesus is always giving something to people who will turn around and betray him. Betrayal is something to think about when we have communion. Someone might say with all the symbolism and metaphors used in religious rituals that you don't have no communion table. You don't have a communion table even at home. We've not come to the altar much over the months, but the issue is not about the altar. The issue is not about the table, but it's about those of us who show up to the table. And betrayal during communion time is not only about this moment, but about every time you turn your back on God. God was there for you, and you turn your back on God. God blessed you, and you turn your back on God. God was doing for you, and you turn your back on God. God was blessing you, and you turn your back on God. You turn your back on God when God helped you. You turn your back on God when God lifted you out of your situation. You turn your back on God when there's a moment when nobody else would help you, but God came to you at your aid. You turn your back on God when you were alone and God came and dried your tears, and now you're not there for God. God blessed you, but you can't bless God. And many of us know what it's like to be betrayed when a mother runs out on you. Many of us know what it's like to be betrayed when your father doesn't show up when you need him most. Many of you know what it's like to be betrayed when folk have made promises to you and did not come through on those promises. Many of you know what it's like to be like Jesus, to sit at a table with people who lie to you at your face when you know all the time they're mistreating you behind your back. Although more than Judas would betray Jesus, they all had their own little way of lying. They lied not only to Jesus, but they lied even to themselves. We dare say this hour, what lies do you keep telling yourself? Jesus already knew that they were two faces. He already knew that one had conspired against him and acted like nothing was going on. He already knew that they had committed to things that they could not follow through on. He already knows what we have done and what we have not done. But the question is, what lies do you keep telling yourself? Is it like the misinformation that people read on social media? Is it like the disinformation that folk keep spreading online? Is it like it the fake news that so many people get excited about and wired up about and fired up about? In lieu of all of their lying and betrayal, thank you, Jesus, 
Jesus had the audacity to give to them anyway. Jesus has the boldness that while they lied to him, that he still gave them something to eat anyway. Isn't it awesome how God, when we lie to him, still turns around and blesses us when he knows your mouth? He still turns around and blesses us when he knows your heart. Is that not like the Lord when we've been up to no good? He turns around and still gives to us. Is it not like the Lord when we've done, when we've not done all that we could do and should do, that he turns around and he still gives to us? Is it not like the Lord when we have failed in life, when we've not done our best, that God turns around and he still blesses us? Is it not like the Lord when we've been low down and dirty and shameful that he still gives to us? He still provides for us. He still cares for us. He still blesses us. We don't deserve it, but he still looks out for his own. Verse 27 tells us, And he took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. Jesus, in the spirit of thanksgiving, took the cup, and the word of God said that he gave thanks. But hold on, Jesus. Hold on. How could you, Lord, be thankful when the disciples that are around you are unappreciative to you? How can you, Lord, be thankful around people that you trained for three years and then they turn their back on you? How can you, Lord, be thankful knowing that in just another day you will be on death row? How, Lord, can you be thankful when you have done no wrong? How, Lord, can you be thankful when you didn't break any laws? You didn't mistreat anybody. You didn't abuse anybody. You did not take things out on other folk. How could you, Jesus, be thankful when the ones you are looking at at the table are pretending that they never knew you, Jesus shows us, brothers and sisters, that in the midst of heavy trials, in the midst of heavy trouble, that you can still be thankful anyway. Jesus shows us that even when things are not going around in your life, that you still can be thankful. Jesus shows us in the midst of adversity about giving thanks. I appreciate a few couple of weeks ago being able to travel to Africa. Can't tell you it all, but we have shared a little bit at a time. And when we went to Ghana that night for worship, they had a word that was posted all around the church. And I hope I pronounce it correctly as I'm still learning myself. But I believe the word was called a quabba. A quabba. It meant to welcome. But to show somebody that you are welcoming them is to have a spirit of hospitality. And when you have a spirit of hospitality, it's because you have a spirit of appreciation. And many people are waiting for Thanksgiving in a couple of weeks. Waiting for the Thanksgiving meal to show thankfulness. But you don't have to wait two weeks from now. One song said that every day is a day of Thanksgiving. You may not have everything you need, but every day is a day of Thanksgiving. You may feel the walls closing in on you. You may feel like the birds too much to carry. You may be sick and waiting for a healing. You may feel like what you're going through is about to tear you down. You may feel like you just can't take it anymore. You may feel like your life is too much to handle. Yet Jesus gives us the example to be thankful. Be thankful around folk that don't like you. Be thankful around people that don't love you. Be thankful around people that misunderstand you. Be thankful when things are not going well. Be thankful when you don't have all that you think you need to have. Be thankful 
thankful when you have trouble in your life. Be thankful when you need a healing and you're still awaiting. Be thankful when you're in the midst of trials. Be thankful in the midst of hard times. Be thankful when things are not going your way. Be thankful when you got bills due and not enough money. Be thankful when you get up in the morning and you don't feel like going nowhere. Be thankful that God has blessed you to be alive one more time. Be thankful in the midst of adversity. And then Jesus tells them, here, take, eat, and drink. But what does it mean to drink all of it? To drink all is reflected that Jesus did not give some, thank you, Lord, but he gave all. He did not give a partial healing but a full healing. He gave his all. Because on that day, he was spared no expense at giving his entire life in shedding his blood. But there's a danger when you give your all, when you give your best, and when you lay it all on the line. It reminds us of the story where religious folk were bringing their offerings to church one day, and Jesus sat to, to watch what they were putting in the treasury. Jesus was close enough to see what everybody was putting in the offering plate. And after all the big dollars and the big money came through, Jesus began to talk about a woman. He began to talk about a poor woman, a widow, who came from the back of the church, if I can use my imagination. She was dressed in dark clothing, and as she walked, she had a slight slant in her walk and a slight hump in her back. But something about her, even though she was a widow, there's something about her, even though she was uh, poor. There was something about her, even though she didn't have what other folk had because of her relationship with the Lord. That's why they were there in the first place. She pulled out her debit card. Can I say she had a debit card? Knowing that she only had a few dollars. She also knew that when she made the donation, that a charge would be placed on her account. Nonetheless, she took her card out and she gave anyway. And Jesus in the text said, that she cast in all that she had, even all her living. Yet she took all that she had and she gave it anyway. But the text is not about money. It's about your relationship. And when you have a relationship with God, you're willing to not only give your best, but you will give your all. Because any time you give all, not only in the plate, but you give all you do and you do it in his name. Jesus sees you and he knows what you're doing. He knows what you're going to In the time you give all your time to support something worthy. In the time you give to make somebody else's life better. In the time you give with what energy you have left. In the time you make your way against oppression and you make your way against public scrutiny and you make because you know if God did it last time, he'll do it again. There's something about giving because you know that can't nobody give to you the way the Lord gives to you because the word reminds us the more you give, the more he gives to you. But this last verse, Matthew 26 and 28, helps to point out at least two things that are so beneficial as we take the communion. Listen to these words as we reread them once again. Jesus said, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. 
He tells them that it's my blood, not for an old covenant, but for a New Testament. You may not see it, but the pandemic is not about going to what's old, but about God doing a new thing. See, every time you and I lift the cup, the cup is out. It is a cup of covenant. It is a reminder of the introduction and the implementation and the institution and the induction of the cycles into an initiation to become a new community. Thank you, Jesus. Many of you know what it means to cover, to become a part of something new. You know what it is to express vows, to be a part of a group and ceremonies and celebrations. Well, oftentimes, there are cups. We have cups, pretty cups, and plastic cups, and fine cups, and clear cups, and small cups, and some of us say it's not enough to put in the cup. We have liquids and refreshments and something to drink to, to signify being part of, of something special, being part of something greater, being part of something bigger than oneself. People, people use cups as a way of saying that we're coming together and, and we're doing it together. You, you may take the communion individually, but we're taking it what, collectively. See, at the wedding before the meal, someone raises their cup or glass and offers a toast because of what? A new covenant. They're doing something new. The bride and, and groom just took vows, and sometimes they will lock arms and take a sip with one another. And, and communion is our time, yes it is, to take a sip with, with one another, to take a sip together, to, to express a new covenant. It's, it's our time, not only as individuals, but we come together to express what? Something, something new. And you might be a person online, or you could be at the airport or the train station. You may be across, across town or even in another state. You may be in the church house, or you might be in, in your house. And it doesn't matter if you're on a cell phone or a laptop or a computer or a desktop. We all are getting ready to do something that's reflective of what of, of something new. You, you may be here or you may be there and wherever you are, we are about to do a new thing. We're, we're drinking of the cup. It's a sign of a, a covenant. Drinking of the cup is a sign of renewal. Drinking of the cup is a sign of the people of faith pressing on. Drinking of the cup is about us not only being reminded of our sins, but about the greatness of Jesus drinking of the cup because we know that Jesus, he loves us anyway. Jesus, he keeps us anyway. Jesus keeps on blessing us. Yes, he does anyway. Finally, it was seen that after feeding disciples, that it was enough. But Jesus takes the customary meal of Passover and we use the word institute, what we call holy communion. And Jesus said that it's not only a, what, new covenant, but that his blood was shed, key word shed, for many for the remission of sins. Remission means to pardon. It reminded me of folk who have had cancer, and cancer has begun to move in their body. And somehow, some way, God grants a miracle. And they say, my cancer is in what? Remission. Remission means to hold in place. It means to forgive and to suspend. And we all have sins, isn't that right? That we need pardon for. We all have sins, something that we need forgiveness from. And we all have sin that we need suspended from. And the shedding of blood is to pour out and to gush out and to run out. When you see Jesus on the cross in your mind, Jesus was not scratched. He was not just dropping out blood, but the blood gushed out. Jesus didn't simply bleed, but Jesus bled. 
reminding us like the oil in a car, that his blood was drained from his body, like the oil gushing out of the drainage pan, and his blood, not Peter's blood, and his blood, not James' blood, his blood, not John's blood, his blood, not Andrew's blood, talking about his blood, not your blood, talking about his blood, not my blood, was shed for me, which tells us when some people have made up their minds on who can be saved and who cannot be saved, his blood was shed for any nation. His blood was shed for any individual. His blood was shed for any group. His blood was shed for any skin color. His blood was shed for any culture. His blood was shed for any upbringing. His blood tells us that any type of class of people, you can have money or no money. You can live on this side of town or the other side of town. You can have the finest of clothes or no clothes. His blood was shed for everybody. And everybody has the opportunity to stand before him. His blood tells us that anybody, that somebody, and everybody that desires to be saved from sin can be saved. His blood tells us that anybody, and everybody, and somebody that desires to be saved from sin can be delivered, can be redeemed, and can be set free. His blood tells us that anybody and somebody and everybody that desires to be saved from sin can be saved. You may have made your mind up, but sometimes we need to remember that God is not finished yet. Anybody and somebody and everybody that desires to be changed from their old wicked lives can be saved. Anybody, somebody, and everybody that desires to change the dirty oil in their life, desires to change the filthy oil in their life, desires to change the worn out oil in their life, they can be saved. But the question must be raised, Jesus, what is it that's so special about the blood of Jesus? What is it that causes his blood to cross racial barriers? What is it that causes his blood to reach any age group? What is it that causes his blood that can touch the depths of the mind? What is it that causes red blood to cleanse a dirty soul? What is it that's so unique about the blood of Jesus? What is so powerful about the blood of Jesus? What is it that's so unusual about the blood of Jesus? What is it that's so peculiar about the blood of Jesus? What is it the reason we keep talking about the blood of Jesus? What is it that's so wonderful about the blood of Jesus? What is it that is so life-changing about Jesus' hemoglobin? What is so light changing about the red and white blood cells of Jesus. What is it about the blood of Jesus? We already sung it earlier today where the hymn is wrote, for it's the blood of Jesus that was shed for you and me. Way back on Calvary, it's the blood like an oil change that gives me strength from day to day. It's the blood like a new filter that gives me strength from day to day. It's the blood of Jesus that gives me strength. It's not the medication and the prescription. It's the blood of Jesus that gives me strength, that gets me up in the morning and started on my way. It's the blood of Jesus that helps me when I'm going through the midst of tribulation. It's the blood of Jesus that helps us to keep on going when you don't feel like going. How many of you need strength right now? How many of you need renewal right now? It's the blood of Jesus that gives strength. How many of you need energy right now? How many of you need help right now? It's the blood of Jesus that gives strength. How many of you need power? How many of you need to go on a little further? It's the blood Jesus. And the song said, it'll never give out. 
on your prescription, you got to go back to the pharmacist. On your car, when it gets empty, you got to go back to the tank. But it's the blood of Jesus. It'll never, it'll never give out. It'll never, it'll never become old. It'll never become powerless. It'll never become useless. It'll never lock up your engine. It'll never stall your pistons. It'll never crawl up your valves. It's the blood of Jesus that'll never lose power. It's the blood of Jesus. Change your all with Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus. Change your life with Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus. Change your habits with Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus, change your thoughts with Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus. Change your behaviors with Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus. Change your steps. Change your all. Change your all. Change your all with Jesus. <laughs>